I think it's important to clarify up front that this is not going to be a holier than thou, I told you so, towards people who grew up enjoying Tim Burton, or even those who still have fond memories of his work. I loved Tim Burton, and it was when I needed him. To cut a long, dramatic story short, I went to a performing arts high school, and in my department, I wasn't exactly anyone's best friend. I was younger than all of my peers, I still can't dance for shit, and I was put in a position where I constantly had to compete for attention, which, whether or not that was even fair, I wasn't really prepared for at that point in my life. I felt like an imposition on the people around me, like I was completely beyond understanding, like I was just testing everyone's patience. And when you feel like a professional failure on top of being a social failure, which you already know full well you can't fix because of all the tism, it, it really kneecaps your sense of self-worth. But that meant that having his work during a pivotal, transitional moment for me, it, it gave me some inclination that I wasn't alone in the world. That as an artist, or even just as a person, I wasn't completely without hope. That someday, someone was going to reach out and let me know that I was capable of being loved just as I was. If anything, all of that is exactly why I've always wondered why it was so easy for me to let go. So I don't know about you guys, but last year was a pretty great year for people who huddle around a fire praying for stop motion films to come along and be our entire personality for a while. Not three, not four, but five exceptional movies which reached a lot of different audiences and played with different genres. Okay, mostly horror this time, but not all of them, shut up. And you know, whether or not they're perfect, they're the kind of thing that you're just grateful to have at all. It is one of the most intimate forms of art because you're watching the tenderest increments of motion brought together over years and years, in some cases almost a whole lifetime, to create something living and breathing. And it's great to see it still going strong in spite of the industry's recent struggles. But more than anything, it got me thinking, it's been a while since we've heard from Tim Burton, right? Like, wasn't this supposed to be his whole scene? Okay, I know it's passe to rag on Tim. I'm not saying anything controversial when I point out that the guy has not been doing his best work for a while. The point of this video is not to shock you by revealing that he's been in his flop era because I would hope that we all understand this going in. That's not the problem that occurred to me when I had this thought. What occurred to me is that everyone else who has tried to do everything Tim Burton was supposed to be the guy for at his peak is now officially better than him. If you want an offbeat blockbuster, you go to James Gunn. Add horror to that equation, well, that's Jordan Peele, easy. Speaking of Peele, Henry Selick's gotten out from under Burton's shadow and established himself as one of the most ubiquitous stop-motion directors in the business after Coraline and Wendelin Wilde. The German expressionist slash British adjacent style Burton turned to to make his work distinct among a sea of blockbusters has been supplanted by the rising mainstream prominence of foreign cinema. Side note, the man really wants to be British. No idea why anyone would. Right. Shit! M. Night Shyamalan, a director who went through a very similar trajectory of rapidly reaching visionary status only to lose it in the aughts, has spent the last few years carving out a comfy little niche for himself with some decent low-budget thrillers. And while David Lynch has always been the poster boy for inscrutable dreamlike filmmaking, even when Burton was dominating Hollywood, his work on Twin Peaks The Return proved that he could be just as frightening and affecting even in the sometimes smothering production process of modern content. He's dead. Guillermo del Toro specifically is gunning for Burton's crown, and I think it's safe to say he's almost cinched it. Del Toro may have arrived too late to the game to have anything near the level of Burton's goth kid notoriety, but what he lacks in Burton's easy marketability he's more than made up for in critical success with movies which he is producing just because he personally would find them interesting. It doesn't hurt that much like Burton, he's kind of become a character in and of himself. This big, friendly dude who unapologetically loves nerdy shit, lets his child actors call him Totoro, and commissions life-size statues of horror icons for his living room. It seemed like the reasonable thing to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure, why not? I don't mean to say that all of these other directors being consistently good at what they do right now makes Burton's past work irrelevant. 
In an ideal world, all of this would be a wow two cakes kind of situation, but it does draw into focus that it was shockingly not hard for him at all to lose what at least a decade ago seemed like an iron grip on his territory within the pop culture landscape. And alright, we gotta talk about it. Recent directorial output aside, it's hard to call Tim blameless for his decline in popularity. <laughs> Once that interview dropped during the press for Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, the writing was on the wall. Burton was well past his best work, and he wasn't really interested in catching up culturally or artistically. The Black Lives Matter movement was not something you could just blithely fail to notice in 2016, and yet what the topic of visibility actually meant to people seemed to have flown over Burton's head entirely. And when his track record for casting non-white actors at the time of this interview ranged from a villain who eats kids' eyes to a couple of minor walk-on characters to not Muhammad Ali to... Uh... Lightning happens to people all the time here. Enough! 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 Shut up! Yeah, you'd be forgiven if you didn't extend Burton the benefit of the doubt. More than anything, I think it destroyed what remained of the illusion that he was still some empathetic voice of the marginalized. If he ever really had been. And I guess what I'm curious to dissect is just how much of it is seeded throughout his films on a foundational level. Whether or not he was always doomed to yell at that cloud. What has his work said about the way he views the people around him? The way he views relationships? The way he views himself? If he only wants to tell certain stories, do those stories indicate in some way that this was always the end result of being Tim Burton? So we're all gonna go on a little journey into my twisted mind to a place I like to call Tim Burton's World of Sad Boys. A magical land where every main character is just you, but tragically hot. Every day is your shitty childhood in Burbank, and every girl is that girl from band who turned you down like a total bitch when you asked her to prom. And as a case study, we're going to use the movie which sent me down here in the first place. The one which really got me questioning just how much of this was inevitably going to fall apart from the beginning, Corpse Bride. Wait, I thought this was one of the last good ones, though. I hate him. Physically. I despise that kind of man. I've never understood why. Have you met him? Oh, yes. I can hardly bear to talk to him. He has the Chaplin disease. That particular combination of arrogance and timidity sets my teeth on edge. He's not arrogant, he's shy. He is arrogant, like all people with timid personalities. His arrogance is unlimited. Anybody who speaks shyly and shrivels up in company is unbelievably arrogant. He acts shy, but he's not. He's scared. He hates himself and he loves himself. A very tense situation. It's people like me who have to carry on and pretend to be modest. To me, it's the most embarrassing thing in the world. A man who presents himself at his worst to get last in order to free himself from his hangups. Everything he does on screen is therapeutic. That is Orson Welles describing Woody Allen in an interview with Henry Jaglum in 1983. Now, as funny as I find this, it's not the nicest thing to say about a person, right? Like, people have social anxiety for a myriad of reasons, and Wells was notorious for being kind of a prick about his peers throughout his life, regardless of whether or not some of them completely, definitely, objectively deserved it. John Landis, well, let me be of some help here. He's a person I can influence. Kill him. No. Actually, maybe in Alan's case, he was being much too fucking kind. Burton's emergence as an alternative blockbuster hitmaker, which came two years after this interview, was not at all dissimilar to how Alan entered the comedy world. Unassuming guys described at the time of their debut as Chaplin-esque, with a quiet charisma which wasn't typical of the most successful artists working in their respective fields, but quickly reinvented the way those fields developed moving forwards. In Burton's case, much of what set him apart in Hollywood came from a background in animation. The fact that his visual style was not only distinct, but accessible and versatile across genres made him an invaluable asset pretty much immediately. He is to auteur theory what Holes is to literary devices, probably the first example you'll be able to easily identify at a young age. I'm not gonna sit here and be a contrarian like, oh, Tim was always a bad director just because I think he's something of a prick, because that is demonstrably untrue. 
Honestly, his sixth film run from Pee Wee's Big Adventure to Ed Wood is at least a more cohesive filmography than some directors will have in their entire lives. Ed Wood in particular is a movie I expected to have aged poorly in some respects given what we know now about Burton, but barring a few choices which are a bit 90s Hollywood writing LGBTQ plus people, it largely holds up. There's a sense of self-awareness and genuine kindness in Ed Wood which is glaringly absent from the films following this one. Ed is so euphoric about the act of creation that he doesn't realize he has no talent, or why audiences in the 1950s wouldn't be interested in a nuanced take on gender nonconformity. The end in particular stings because it follows this fantasy encounter with Orson Welles motivating Ed to fight for his vision, a big dreamlike Hollywood premiere, and a romantic proposal in the rain with the cold hard truth. That Ed Wood died in disgrace, that he never got to enjoy his own cult status, and that, in a cruel twist of fate, Plan 9 from Outer Space was his last great movie. Hey, what's that doing there? Look. The man is allowed to make whatever stupid bullshit he wants, and in the right hands, stupid bullshit can be really fun. If he just made family films forever, that also would have been fine. It's not what you make, it's how well you can make it. But I think it's fair to say that had he at least continued in this general direction, acknowledged the pros and cons of the Tim Burton experience, and pushed himself to branch out a bit more frequently, especially in regards to his relationship with marginalized communities, we would be having very different discussions about his work. Actually, before I get into the main stuff, we gotta step to one side and talk about the proverbial hot topic in the room. Jack Skellington may be the face of Burton's empire, but I think we give him a bum deal because we're mutually ashamed of having been a little too into the Nightmare Before Christmas when we were annoying ass teenagers. No, he's not the world's deepest character, that's not an unfair assessment, but like, overall, he's fine. He's fine! Hell, he's even better once you're no longer 13 and taking him 100% seriously, because when you take a step back, he's one of the funniest characters anyone has ever created. He is a melodramatic dumbass with burnout, who massively overreacts after having visited Christmas Town once, accidentally teaches his community militant cultural appropriation, and reacts to having fucked up harder than anyone has ever fucked up with, well, hey, we all learned a valuable lesson, right? This is not a criticism. I love the shit out of this. You guys know how I roll. Oh, I love trash. It's been well documented by now that authorship of The Nightmare Before Christmas is not particularly cut and dry. It was a very personal project to Danny Elfman, for whom this was ostensibly the breakup album for Oingo Boingo, so the songs cover pretty much every critical emotional plot beat, but director Henry Selick and screenwriter Carolyn Thompson have differing accounts of who filled in which blanks between Elfman's work. The only thing everyone can agree on is that Burton's role in the actual filmmaking process was to ensure that the basic story structure remained the same, hiring a screenwriter who didn't do his job and leaving everyone else to fill in the blanks at the last minute, and when anyone suggested changing anything in the outline, he became actually violently angry and no, I am not being hyperbolic, look that up, it actually happened. With these big size 14 Doc Martens. <laughs> He kicked a hole in the wall, and I went, Tim, uh, is your foot okay? He said, yeah, they're steel toes. Regardless of who contributed what, The Nightmare Before Christmas and Jack himself passed through a lot of hands. Everyone on the creative team saw a little bit of themselves in Jack and Sally, literally in Elfman and Thompson's case since they were dating during production, and I think that might explain why the movie and the central romance holds up in spite of its simplicity. It wasn't a completely unified vision, but it had a lot of eyes on it, and a lot of people whose perspective played a big role in making it function as well as it does. Sally's main character trait is that she's kind of got the only brain cell in town, which makes her the only one who can see the real, practical issues with Jack's Christmas thing. And there's an argument to be made, maybe a subjective argument, but one which I think has some strong legs within the text, that Sally isn't Jack's reward for pulling his head out of his own ass. Jack pulling his head out of his own ass and finally appreciating how much she was willing to do for him is Sally's reward. Jack's reward is finally getting to share the true meaning of Christmas with Halloween Town rather than struggling to translate the concept for people who don't have the language to contextualize what made it so special to Jack in the first place. Is it the world's most dense romantic story arc? No. 
but there's a sense of everyone getting what they wanted. More importantly, I don't think that any sense of wish fulfillment is skewed in one direction. Too much of this plot is about how Jack actively fucked up Christmas real bad for me to get any sense that this is just a reward for Jack. Why I think this is worth bringing up at all is for three reasons. One is going to make more sense later, two is because I'm reclaiming Jack Skellington, I'm sorry, I'm planting my flag, he can't be cringe anymore folks, we have to take him back. But the third is that because it has all of these different perspectives coming together to create this collaborative image of what constitutes a Tim Burton film, one which has arguably become the er example of a Tim Burton film, you can directly compare it to a movie which came about specifically as a result of Nightmare, where he was on top of pretty much every creative of choice from beginning to end. And it's the one with insanely worse pacing. Seriously, they are the exact same length. How in the hell? I completely understand why people still remember 2005's Corpse Bride fondly, even without the context of the rest of his filmography. A stop-motion gothic romance musical about accidentally marrying the undead just sounds exactly like the kind of film you would want him to make, and it's centered around a lot of tropes Burton has done before to strong results. Look, I'm not gonna lie, everything that 13-year-old me should have been losing her shit over is here. Everything that I should love about a movie now is in theory here, but there is always this thing. Even when I was in the throes of Burton mania, when I was sure he was going to be my ride or die director forever, I always had this nagging question in the back of my head. Why don't I like Corpse Bride as much as I should? I think it's held on to its positive reputation for as long as it has because depending on where you think Burton fell off, it's either one of the last good movies he made or a brief return to form after his late 90s slump. And visually, yeah, I won't argue that this film is pretty impressive. It doesn't nearly match the technical ambition of Nightmare, but the colors are nice, the animation is fluid, and the puppets do a perfect job of translating Burton's flat, sketchy style to a fun kind of fucked up Rankin Bass looking vibe. Man, I hope the animators who worked on this film went on to do something cool after this. Now I know I said that stop motion films are the kind of thing you appreciate having even if the story is a little weak, and I do stand by that. I don't necessarily think Corpse Bride shouldn't have been made. There's nothing morally abhorrent in there, there's stuff to like. It could have been really amazing. But keep in mind that at the time, Burton was almost synonymous with stop motion in the mainstream consciousness. You could argue that Aardman was the best-known studio at the time, and for good reason, but Burton was the auteur. This was supposed to be Burton returning to his roots, so if this is supposedly a visionary in his element, I don't think it's unfair to approach this film with that context. He's also out here in a couple interviews for this film being very vague about what his actual contributions to The Nightmare Before Christmas were when people ask him about it. So if he's selling his work on Stolen Valor, I feel validated in judging him more harshly. Felix Squad, bitch. And story-wise, I'm sorry, I know people have praised this one for being simple, and if it clicks for you on an emotional level, I love that, but I think it's kind of a mess. Character arcs are unpolished if present at all, the themes are wobbly, and the stuff that isn't predictable is kind of dry. A lot of the songs do the exact inverse of Nightmare, a movie which is 80% songs and just grind shit to a halt, which is really, really not what you want for a movie which is only 75 minutes long and already struggling from pacing issues. Which is so strange to me, because historically, Burton does his best when he keeps it simple. Simple is kind of all he knows how to do, for better or worse. The man is not the master of multifaceted narratives. The way he approaches his animated work is really not fundamentally different from the way he approaches his live action work either, so the whole, oh, this is a movie for kids conversation can't just wipe that away, especially because he vocally hates the notion that he would ever just make movies for kids. But that was what seemed to be his strength infusing simple premises with his unique visual thumbprint. And none of this is new territory for the guy at face value, so I don't know why this isn't at the very least serviceable for what it is. Why are the vibes so off on this one?
Notable about Corpse Bride is that it's one of Burton's rare story credits. For as much creative control as he exercises over his films, it's really infrequent to see him attributed to any part of the writing process. The only instances where he takes a story credit are some of his most personal works. Edward Scissorhands, The Nightmare Before Christmas, and Frankenweenie are films which are really the most about Burton out of his entire filmography, even though Nightmare was filtered through a few more people. What this indicates to me are two things. One, he was more directly involved with the narrative of Corpse Bride from its conception than a lot of the projects he's historically taken on. And two, though anyone who saw Alice in Wonderland or Big Eyes could have told you this, the man does not get women. Jesus Christ, he's so bad at women. It's disappointing that this film can't live up to its potential, because in terms of Beauty and the Beast narratives, you would be extremely hard-pressed to find any which flip the gender roles, though recent examples have given the central relationship a bit more depth. The Disney movie introduced the concept of Beauty also being a social outcast in spite of her conventionally attractive appearance. Del Toro's The Shape of Water takes it a step further not only by casting her as a disabled woman in the 60s, but by making her the one who takes the initiative and instigates the romantic relationship with the Beast, an explicitly sexual one at that. But as for female characters who have any physical traits which could be categorized as monstrous in a story about beauty being found within, you're not really going to find any prominent examples outside of this film, or at least not any which have really broken through to the public consciousness. And, uh, no. This doesn't count. Before any of you look at me, like, the whole reason I'm gonna get mad at this movie is because Emily didn't get the guy at the end, I fully believe that this plot as it stands could be emotionally resonant. It can work. Take the Phantom of the Opera as a point of comparison. Supposing we, the audience, are intended to see the Phantom as a tragic figure, even someone who should have the chance to be loved, it doesn't change the fact that he has done some unambiguously reprehensible shit to have Christine all to himself. Christine showing him kindness isn't about proving he has a shot, it's about getting the shock to the system he needs to realize that he's gone way too far and has to let her go. Raoul is kind of milk-toast in comparison, sure, but at least he's genuinely offering her emotional support and not actually killing people to solve his relationship problems. It is a sacrifice on the Phantom's part, but it's one he needs to make to grow because he's been a massive bitch for the entire show. This obviously doesn't apply in quite the same way to Corpse Bride, and Burton says that was intentional. Fuck! Victor is sort of an outcast. So are the bride and Victoria. Yeah, the love triangle and corpse bride. They're all outcasts in their own way. And that's the beauty of the story to me. That's what gave it its poignancy to me. It's bittersweet with a sort of hopeful and sad quality all together. The juxtaposition of who is going to be with who and what's going to end up happening was a very tricky balance to get, but something that was, again, crucial and important to who he was. I don't necessarily see that as a bad approach. Sometimes everyone deserves to be happy in a situation where that may not ultimately be possible. Yeah, it's a bit hard to swallow, but that's just life. But the thing is, is that I've seen Burton do love triangles, and let's just say that when it's a two guys and one girl situation, he is never this gracious. There is a right answer, and there is a wrong answer, and you can pretty clearly telegraph which one is which. Like, hmm. Well, this guy seems all right. He wears short shorts, I wear scissors, he's cheer captain and I'm cutting bushes and dogs. To put it bluntly, Burton's got a bad case of never got the cheerleader. He's hung up on these light-haired, doll-eyed white women who just kind of smile and tacitly accept every eccentricity, and then a romance happens. Their arcs are typically do I love this weird guy? And the answer to that nine times out of ten is yes. And if there's a bridge to cross, let's just say that he's not typically the one who has to do any of the crossing. I actually have a lot of affection for characters who are just, like, classic ingenues. I accept that I'm kind of biased on that, but what that means is that you gotta trust me when I say that it's not like Burton does it once or twice. Because if it was once or twice, I wouldn't take a whole section out of this video to shit on him for it. But it's not once or twice. 
you want a romance in a Tim Burton film, this is what you get. I think the one exception is this character from Frankenweenie, but they make up for it by just not giving her any personality or reason to be in the plot at all outside of getting saved, so that really evens things out. As a result, Burton's kind of got a bit of a Madonna horror complex. Sexually active women scare the shit out of him. If that lady is horny on Maine, you bet your ass she is going to cause some goddamn problems. Especially if she is middle-aged. And if he's sex-averse, that's one thing. He's allowed that. Even if it doesn't explain why his almost completely sexless relationships are so empty and basic. But there are two kinds of people in Burton world. People who look down on him and say no, and people who see that special something inside of him and say yes. And I wonder if what actually freaks him out is the idea of someone who is going to grow up and become more demanding as opposed to someone who's eternally young and uncomplicated and just so ding dang darn happy to be in love with him. I mean Victor. I mean him. Perhaps there's a bit of a witch in you, Katrina. Why do you say that? Because you've bewitched me. Oh, fuck off. It's a tendency which winds up leaving his very few female leads, at least half of whom still fit the typical love interest archetype, in the lurch because all he can really do is try to copy paste his own already kind of vague experiences over them with a healthy dose of, hey girls. Isn't it hard being a woman? But clearly he knows that putting a movie on a lead he can't write or relate to is gonna take the air out of the whole thing. So he always makes sure to carve out plenty of time for the male co-lead. Big Eyes spends much more time being about the lies of Walter Keene than the eventual vindication of Margaret Keene. Alice in Wonderland is about Alice's bog-standard hero's journey where she looks inside herself and learns that she has the power to colonize China. But hey, since we've got time, What's the Mad Hatter up to? Emily's probably one of Burton's stronger female characters by a long shot. If this were a better film, or if he had a better track record, I don't think I'd be so nice about her. But she's got this innocence and passion for life that easily becomes the most infectious part of the movie. Even if she doesn't end up with Victor, you do want her to be happy. But if she doesn't need to learn a lesson because she didn't do anything wrong here, there has to be some sense that her character arc has a satisfying, emotionally fulfilling conclusion. And that would be much easier to believe if it didn't severely zag in the middle. Emily's had a rough break on account of getting serial killed, but for the most part, she's not hung up on that. She's really more excited to have a second chance at love, which she has extremely little evidence to believe is not what she thinks it is, so you're immediately kind of dreading the moment when the other shoe drops. And when reality hits in the harshest way possible, it shatters her. Like, is she unlovable or less than human for reasons she can't control because of trauma she's trying to leave in the past? Is everything good about her worth nothing if she isn't acceptable? More importantly, if she isn't going to find the answer to that question by marrying Victor, how does she? Guys? Guys? How do we resolve that? See, the subplot about the evil lord who killed Emily, stealing Victor's place at the wedding, and marrying Victoria for money she doesn't have isn't just there to give her more screen time and make it more urgent that Victor get back to the land of the living, even though Victor doesn't actually know that. It's also to give Emily one thing to do in the climax, which is treated like a big character moment, but objectively, not the resolution to any conflict in the plot they set up. Her whole pace-killing song wasn't about her being sad because she got murdered. She was sad because she didn't know if she could be loved the way she is. Which is not a question we've ever struggled to answer before in any of your other movies. But it's funny that we're dodging it now. So what is the tangible obstacle here? The movie seems to think the big one is the general ethics of letting someone poison themselves, even though it flip-flops on whether or not death is even all that much of a punishment. Is it just because Victoria got there first and making someone else sad is mean? Even though, again, every time it's a dude, it's totally okay to steal your girl. I'd be willing to accept that a little if Victoria had some, like, childhood best friend advantage, which could make total sense for this arranged marriage setup, but Tim can't even fathom a woman tolerating him that long, so that's off the table. 
Jesus Christ, shoujo manga from the 70s has more depth than this. John August worked on the script for this, right? What, what's his take? As we worked on the story, Corpse Bride kept becoming more and more likable, to the point where we started to wonder exactly the question you ask. Should maybe Victor end up with Corpse Bride? The solution wasn't to diminish Corpse Bride, but rather to beef up Victoria. Over the drafts, we made sure to give her more initiative, such as escaping the mansion to plead for the pastor's help, and make her situation more dire. The wedding to Barkus was a surprisingly late addition. Yeah, well, that tracks. Okay. Corpse Bride's decision to stop Victor from drinking the wine of ages, added in the last draft, is less about saving his life, after all, death isn't so bad, and more about seeing herself in Victoria. It goes back to want versus need. Corpse Bride wants to be married, but what she needs is to free herself from her self-imposed curse. What? What? Self-imposed... That's not the plot. That's not the character you wrote. You kept your promise. You set me free. No, he didn't. Free from what? The ground? What the fuck does this have to do with anything? You're just making shit up now. I'm starting to think you don't even want a big titty goth GF, Tim. Look, it just really, really irks me that I know for a fact, based on historical evidence, that if the genders were reversed in this situation, there wouldn't be any of these weird narrative U-turns. At the very least, like Edward Scissorhands' bittersweet ending, there would be one consistent answer as to why the story can only conclude the way it does. The fact that the script in its final, quote, most focused, end quote, form, after multiple revisions, still can't do that, gives me the impression that the problem at its root is that there was a conclusion this film had to reach and a lot of people struggled to get it there. And if you go back through old drafts and storyboards, you can see versions of this story where Emily was more actively in denial about her marriage to Victor being an accident. You know something she would have to grow out of, something which might give her choice to sacrifice her own happiness some actual weight, something they removed when Emily started being more sympathetic and just straight up didn't replace with anything. And is it not somewhat telling that Burton can't even flip the genders of a Beauty and the Beast dynamic without getting thrown severely off balance? Like, this is one of his go-to tropes, but the minute he is asked to be on the giving end of love can overcome any difference, all of a sudden there's all these reasons we can't. As if having to deal with this whole situation is one big imposition on Victor. Again, not framing we've ever seen in a romance with Tim, Weird that this is where we've decided it needs to be. I don't know, maybe it would have been nice to take this premise and use it to extend women who struggle to love themselves a bit of that affirmative fantasy Burton's so fond of, because God knows, historically there aren't many for women who are anything remotely short of conventionally attractive, but the fact that he can't even mildly shift gears within his own already narrow parameters of who he wants to tell stories about is considerably less than inspiring. The thing that was important was to get all three points of view. You never wanted Victor to come across as an asshole or the girls to come across like total bitches. You feel bad for Victoria, you feel equally bad for Victor, and there's manipulation on both sides, but you understand it. Classy, Tim, but didn't work. Didn't work. You know what's really insane? Everything they did to make it more believable that Victor should naturally end up with Victoria accidentally works in reverse. While she's trying to save Victor from the land of the dead, Victoria is miraculously self-actualizing. She starts the movie acknowledging that she's been repressed but is going along with what everyone wants anyways. Mother won't let me near the piano. Music is improper for a young lady. Too passionate, she says. And ends it having defied that persona. It doesn't make her the strongest character either, she's very much still the same girl next door archetype, but Victoria is growing independently in a way nobody else in the movie gets to, and yet the movie doesn't really see the clear opportunity it has to make that her character arc. Perhaps in disappointment we are perfectly matched. Like. Why wouldn't it be cool for her want to be marrying Victor, but her need to break free and embrace her own passion? Why is the only character who actually managed to grow beyond who she was at the start of the movie sent back to where she began? 
Because if she does, that means she can't get together with Victor. And if Emily gets with Victor, she doesn't have to make a noble sacrifice to make the ending seem deeper than it actually is. Everyone's personal growth has to be coordinated around Victor. Which is great, because Victor fucking sucks. So the reason I've never thought that a Burton Adams family would work is pretty neatly characterized by the 90s films and their approach to conservative America. The Adamses are never actually in opposition to their normal community. They don't understand all of it, it actually kind of freaks them out, but they're happy to get along and even welcome others to join their traditions. They're active in the community in their own weird way, they've carved out a comfortable day-to-day -day routine, they're only really counterculture in the sense that they'll wish you a terrible morning and read their kids the version where the cat dies. What the Adams Family, and especially Adams Family values, really get is that the problem isn't just as broad as ignorance, it's the cultural and political mouthpieces which enable that ignorance as some signifier of rational thought, regardless of any empirical evidence. Adams Family Values deliberately takes its name from the Republican self-branding as the party of family values, protecting the archaic myth of the nuclear family at the cost of, well, pretty much everyone else. And as we all already know, judo throws the conservative education system which inevitably keeps this annoying fucking cycle going straight onto its ass. And while that's a hard spell to break on certain members of society, even those who would clearly benefit from an alternative, open-minded community but dig their heels in anyway, it's not impossible. Burton is actually not as much of a fuck society guy as I think his persona has led people to believe. The closest he ever gets to going there is Sweeney Todd, and he can't really avoid that because it's baked into the text and if he tried to change a single line in the score, Stephen Sondheim would have justifiably murdered him in his sleep. Simon, was there anything you wanted to say? When you lean into a rhyme, you shatter the conversational tone of the lyric. It's like nails on a blackboard to me, and I love you all. Like, he's down to spook the straights every now and then, but he has no overarching interest in abandoning the system for a less repressed alternative where he'd be completely surrounded by like-minded people. He acknowledges they exist, he just doesn't seem to want to take the plunge and join them. If anything, they freak him out more than the normies do. What his real thesis is, is tolerance, not judging people by appearances or their inability to conform to a social ideal. Look, I don't fundamentally disagree that we should seek empathy and acceptance as much as infrastructural change. Just abandoning society, even when it doesn't accept you, is a privilege not everyone has. Many marginalized communities do go out of their way to provide alternatives for those who face additional hurdles towards getting proper financial support, proper jobs, proper health care. But we can all agree that the goal should be to make sure those hurdles are done away with outright, and that can't happen without the acceptance of a larger community. And on an emotional level, feeling as if society has abandoned you is not just draining, it is downright scary. Especially when people are willing to look away from clear acts of violence and hate being committed against you because there's an implicit acceptance that who you are just makes you more susceptible to that kind of thing. But that's not really a train of thought I think Burton's going down at all. Which, as I've already implied, he's not necessarily obligated to do. There are plenty of successful artists who create stuff without any clear-cut political substance, and they can do it effectively. But for a guy who won't stop talking about the pain of being rejected from society, passively ignoring the tangible, horrifying realities of being rejected from society, reads as a little odd to me. So if we're never going to get into the broader social implications of these narratives, which Corpse Bride certainly doesn't outside of arranged marriage bad, it lives and dies on whether it functions on an emotional level, and logic dictates that should center around its lead. So what's Victor's character arc? What is his want versus need? Well his want is to marry Victoria, uh, but what his need is is to get back to the land of the living to save Victoria. No, that's not a motivation, because he doesn't know he is saving her until it is the end of the movie and she is literally standing in front of him and there is a knife to her neck. That is a climax happening at someone. Let's try it again. 
I'm not really getting anything here, guys. Johnny has said that he scrambled Victor together in about 15 minutes. Was it that instantaneous? Oh, yeah. We were shooting Charlie one day, and it was like, hey, let's do some recording tonight. And as we were walking over, he was like, shit, who is this character? What is he doing? I have no idea. Great thing is, he likes to work spontaneously, too. And really, in that one session, he got it. Do you actually want to brag about that? Because I can fucking tell. Victor never makes any real, tangible progress as a character. He does not learn anything. He does not change. He starts the movie pretty much exactly how he ends it. And it's not because he had an infectiously lovely personality to begin with when he is not being an awkward, gloomy mess, which is his entire character outside of, oh, yep, you guessed it, another tortured artist. He is, in fact, kind of a prick at every plot beat where Victor should logically start opening up and thinking of Emily and the Land of the Dead more positively, even on a purely platonic level, but one which would pose a reasonable threat to his goal of returning home, he instead just kind of doubles down and backs off. Well, there were plot beats where that happened. Surprise! Those got taken out too. He gets reunited with his dog. No, he bonds with Emily over playing the piano. No. He never actually starts fully enjoying it, even though the film establishes that the world he comes from is seriously repressed. The only time he really starts to engage is when he believes he has no other option, which the movie frames as a kindness he's willing to do for Emily, but I don't know, after a movie of doing nothing but sighing about things not going according to plan, while still acknowledging that plan meant he had no autonomy in his life, it doesn't exactly read to me as character growth as much as it does an emotional breakdown. Which, by the way, somehow is still not his job to resolve at the end of the film. It's Emily's. Emily, the one who has been the most wronged out of anyone in this situation, has to be the grown-up and make the call for him. Like, it's noble of him to even consider her as a pity lay. No, Victor. I understand. No, Uggos. Nothing about the status quo is truly challenged. Nothing about society has been fundamentally questioned or changed. No one's deep-rooted perception of who they're supposed to be is interrogated. It's all lip service. Emily gets brought back to life only to be told that she doesn't really need a second chance to be happy. She can have all the personal growth as a treat. She may as well have never been here. And once you realize that, the whole movie just feels like a pointless, borderline cruel exercise. Victor being somewhat inert has nothing to do with the material. I'm not going to accept that. In terms of gothic romance, consider Phantom again. Christine is an ingenue, but she has a want versus need. Wants to believe she's actually talking to an angel from her dead dad who lives in the mirror, needs to let go of her grief so it can't be used to manipulate her anymore. Not something she's doing wrong, but it's a way she has to choose to grow. And it's probably pointless to bring up the actual Jewish folktale Burton offhandedly cited as the inspiration for the film, as August states that Burton chose to strip the premise of all cultural context and move it to Victorian England to make it more universal, which is a whole other incredibly bleak discussion about why he interprets universal as scrubbing away any trace that it wasn't originally conceived for a white Gentile audience, but the point is that folk tales are in active conversation with the morals and needs of the communities they originate from. Not only has Burton ignored that, he's removed it from the equation entirely on purpose. Hand-waving a lack of character growth as simple literary convention is not only cutting him too much slack, it's a slight against talented storytellers who put in the work to make these narratives meaningful. And Andrew Lloyd Webber. What kind of broke me about this realization is that when I look at Burton's other protagonists to find character arcs to compare this to, I can't. Most of Burton's leads do not have substantive character arcs. None of them have to grow in any way. None of them have anything to learn. None of them have to be proactive in their relationships. None of them really even have a want versus need outside of just being happy which makes the complete misread of Emily's want versus need even more rich. And that may be one thing when your lead is doomed by their own ignorance like Ed Wood, or, you know, 
Batman, but another when they're just some variation on you. Cause I hope I'm not surprising anyone, but that's most Tim Burton leads. And we can go back and forth all day, whether a binary character arc is always a necessary thing. I really don't think it is. In some cases, trying to shove one in where there shouldn't be is actively worse. Nor do I think that the only way to make a good movie about yourself demands you go full wind rises and ask if everything you've ever made was a terrible idea. But when you spend your entire filmography making surface level movies about the same guy whose problems are never even solved once by personal growth, does it not raise a few questions about what you think society owes that one specific kind of guy? You could argue that it's smart of him to stay in his lane and stick to personal experience, and at this point, with the benefit of hindsight, I wouldn't even blame you all that much. But the problem is that the perspective from which he views his own personal experience has unwittingly manifested in this overarching theme across his work that being nice to Tim Burton is a moral imperative. That is the binary on which characters are judged. And I think it's fine in some situations to play in that heightened reality where things are exaggerated and maybe not so much fueled by nuance as they are commentary on the apparent absurdities and contradictions of the world. Bigotry in and of itself lacks nuance. And really, we should make fun of powerful assholes who make life difficult for everyone else and think they can dictate who other people should be. But the fact that everyone is a caricature, no matter what the tone of any given piece is supposed to be, gives me the sneaking suspicion that this is the most nuance Burton is capable of. He talks about his approach to all of his work like he's never dumbing things down. And if that's the case, I think this is genuinely how he sees the world. He doesn't believe in anything. His fantasy isn't society opening its doors to the people who would benefit from a reevaluation of its biases because society doesn't ultimately need reevaluating in any meaningful way. He wants it as it is with a small enough space for people like him to get through, who don't actually deserve to be outcasts and are secretly really cool. He's not like that, Queens. He is, as they say, one of the good ones. Because within that fantasy, he is preoccupied with what the rest of the world thinks of him, and especially his art. Just because people like my work, that means automatically it's bad! No, but it doesn't make it art either. Why is everything here completely pointless? Candy doesn't have to have a point. That's why it's candy. You're wasting your life making shit! Nobody cares! These movies are terrible! A take which really loses its punch when you realize he's had carte blanche to make whatever he wants for almost his entire career. Keep in mind, the man went to CalArts, got scooped up by Disney, and then went straight into Pee Wee's Big Adventure once they fired him, so he hasn't actually been some kind of artist on the fringe since he was making movies in high school. I'm a loner, daddy. A rebel. Not that it stops him from complaining about the Hollywood system, he frequently acknowledges that it's stifling and that most of the time he hates it, but what's he gonna do, become a dirty fucking indie director? I don't think it's at all a coincidence, in fact, that Del Toro's rise to prominence coincided with the reevaluation of Burton as a much more socially conservative thinker than he had appeared to be at face value. Del Toro happily makes choices within the system, which Burton had been given every opportunity to make at his peak, but didn't actually want to. On an emotional scale, what Del Toro got that seemed to be beyond Burton was that a truly subversive change of perspective isn't about making things dark or recasting the conventional hero. It's about looking at the world with unambiguous humanity and love and interrogating the motives of those who don't. Whether the subjects of his films deserve compassion or not, he always applies that lens because discrimination is the language of those who fear things as they are being questioned. And that discrimination has real life victims, not just some nebulous quote unquote different community that you can put yourself on top of because it suits your story better. Those may not be revolutionary choices. He may not even be a perfect person, but those choices are far more thoughtful than Burton's ever have been. Choices which made Burton's veneer of universal kindness finally start to ring hollow until he just flat out admitted it never was himself. 
My tipping point during the process of going into Burton's filmography was Frankenweenie, because there's an element hiding in there which shows his ass harder than I think anything has shown it before. Victor Frankenstein is a boy who loves making movies in his little suburb with his dog. His parents support him and encourage his creativity, but they worry he doesn't have any friends. And if you've seen any Burton film before, you would assume it's because he's a little art nerd in an all-American town surrounded by perfect all-American kids who love all-American shit like baseball and local barbecues. But his entire class is made up of oddballs. Strange, morbid kids inspired by the same horror film Victor loves, who all share his fascination with mad science. But Victor can't relate to them. He doesn't really want to. He never outwardly says why, but in all his interactions with them, we see him actively distance himself because they're odd, or jealous of his talent, or... Uh... So let's just break this down. Burton's whole thing has been that when he grew up, there was never anyone else like him. He felt like Frankenstein's monster getting chased down by angry villagers. Nobody reached out to him because he was the only little boy in Burbank who liked Godzilla. But now... Everyone else is too weird for him, and yet somehow he still turned it around to keep himself as the outcast because he's the most normal? And he at no point stopped during the arduously lengthy process of making a stop motion film, looked at this setup, and thought, hey, this might actually be weirdly antithetical to my entire brand? Oh my god, I have to say it. I can't not say it. Oh my god. Not only are you the exact brand of person who Neon Genesis Evangelion is about, you are also the exact brand of person who would completely and confidently miss the point of Neon Genesis Evangelion. Shinji's useless. The girls are bitches. He's supposed to be the hero, but he's not doing anything. Yeah. Because the whole series is about what happens when you realize that you're not the protagonist of reality, and that not everyone can nobly speedrun their own personal issues to prioritize your character growth. That moving past your pain means extending the love you need, and that it's worth the risk, and you need to accept that you might not always get a reward. Maybe the concept of not viewing the people around you like cosmetic skins for whatever emotional purpose you need them to serve to make your life better is one which could fucking benefit you. You know why people still like Jack Skellington even after being cringe-ass teens? Because he's capable of changing in the ways that matter. And the ways he doesn't are funny enough on purpose to get a pass. But more importantly, he loves himself. He chooses to love himself. That's right. I am the Pumpkin King! <laughs> it isn't someone else's unconditional love that solves his problem. It definitely isn't society accepting him for the secret genius he is. He didn't love himself. He fucked things up. Now he has to change. And as it turns out, that's the only way he can truly see and reciprocate the extent of the affection other people have for him. And across a filmography which spans 40 years, a filmography of one man making the same film, starring the same guy, wearing slightly different hats over and over and over again until one of them solves the mystery of why he was so sad in high school, or at Disney, or in Hollywood, I struggle to think, of any other Burton lead about whom I can definitively say the same. I hate him. Physically. I despise that kind of man. I've never understood why. Have you met him? Oh, yes. I can hardly bear to talk to him. He has the Chaplin disease. That particular combination of arrogance and timidity sets my teeth on edge. He's not arrogant, he's shy. He is arrogant, like all people with timid personalities. His arrogance is unlimited. Anybody who speaks shyly and shrivels up in company is unbelievably arrogant. He acts shy, but he's not. He's scared. He hates himself and he loves himself. A very tense situation. It's people like me who have to carry on and pretend to be modest. To me, it's the most embarrassing thing in the world. A man who presents himself at his worst to get last in order to free himself from his hangups. 
Everything he does on screen is therapeutic. I went back to my old high school to work during the pandemic. I was really just a proxy body for teachers who had to call in from home, you know, make sure the in-person kids don't kill each other, but for a year, it was a good job. I wrote my first screenplay there, I earned my masters, I even got to teach for a little while. But that entire time, I hadn't visited any of the dance studios. And the first time I went into one on my own, on the very last day of school, I cried. I really, really cried because I remembered dancing like an asshole in that room and looking in the mirror and feeling like I was never going to catch up and that nobody wanted me enough to care if I did. I realized that I still wasn't above that pain. But I wondered why I ever thought I needed to be. Sure, I thought of how much I'd grown. I have grown. But in that moment, it didn't matter because growing doesn't wipe the hurt away. It just gives you more tools to deal with it. I won't argue that if the reason he is the way he is is because he's neurodivergent, which has been discussed as a very real possibility, but is unconfirmed by all accounts, he should just be able to do what I did. I understand that I'm speaking from a place of privilege based on when I was born and when I was diagnosed. And on the other hand, I understand that any of my pity is all but wasted on an adult man who has been more successful in a single year than I'll be in my entire life, which gives him access to every opportunity to broaden his perspective of the world. I just mean to say that over the course of this process, I couldn't help but think that if I put all of my feelings about my childhood into a story, it still might not read so differently from his. If Burton is caught in that scary, isolated period in his life forever, that's not something I'm willing to blame him for. I don't even think he shouldn't talk about it anymore. But the trouble is that the more often you tell the same story, the more you stretch it in every different direction like an old shirt, the easier it is to start seeing the holes. And if you portray yourself as someone who won't make a film without your heart completely in it, and those films start to reveal something narrow and thoughtless about your view of the world, which you're unwilling to change, well, yeah. Emotional honesty is a double-edged sword like that. I feel like I should offer a solution here, you know? I don't like to tear something down without some concept of how it can be built back up. That's not the kind of person I want to be. But the fact is, we're past the point where working to fix his problem is my job. It is not my job to diagnose him. It is not my job to rehabilitate the persona he ruined, considering he's never once apologized for any of the racially insensitive shit he said or done, it's not even my job to be all that nice to him. For a moment, I did need Tim Burton. And even if it was just for that moment, I won't pretend I don't know why I did. But if growing past that meant that I'd found the love I needed within myself, I'm really not too sad to leave him behind. sad boys. Uh, what a trip this one was. Um, it got much more personal than I anticipated. It got much more in-depth than I anticipated. But ultimately, I'm very, very proud of how it turned out. And as always, I'm very excited to hear what you guys thought of it. Uh, so please let me know. 
Big shout out to the Oddity Roadshow crew for providing the very first guest voices we've ever had on the channel. Um, Allison, Paul, Joel, and Shannon all gave me some amazing stuff, and it was really exciting to get to work with them because Oddity Roadshow is quickly becoming one of my favorite podcasts, and considering how bad I am at podcasts, I do genuinely mean that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, so all of the links are in the description below. Um, it's an actual play podcast combining body horror and the little idiosyncrasies of roadside attractions in the American South. So obviously it has a very special place in my heart and I hope you guys check it out and find a little place for it too. If you'd like or you're able, no pressure, you can also check out my Patreon, which is something I have now. Um, I post behind the scenes content, sneak peeks, and monthly exclusive articles. In this case, uh, it'll be a postscript write-up of this video, what I thought worked, how development went, things that I'm sort of feeling after the fact. So if you want some exclusive content or your name in the credits, please check that out. Uh, you can find me on most social media for the time being, I know, based on when I'm posting this. It's a little bit tenuous, but I will always keep you guys updated on where you can find me and what's going on, because really, the fact that this channel has grown so much in just a year is really owed all to you. So thank you again, and I hope that you're looking forward to what's coming in the future, because man oh man, there's so much stuff coming, and I can't wait to share it with you. Um, and... Uh... Oh yeah, uh, this video was sponsored by Squarespace.